trained by adversity, tried by experience, and tested by fire. But I'm a volunteer in this army, but I won't get out, sell out, be talked out, or pushed out because I'm faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. And if the Lord needs me, I'm there. If he needs me to uh, help the children, help the people, teach the children, work with the homeless, to help the community just sit and learn, he can use me because I'm there, because I'm a soldier and I am committed. I can't lose enough to turn around and I can't be discouraged enough to cause me to quit. Because when Jesus called me into his army, I had nothing. So if I end up with nothing, I'll still be the victim. Devils can't stop me. People can't disillusion me. Weather can't stop me. Sickness can't wear me. Battles can't defeat me. And money definitely can't buy me. Because I'm a soldier. And I won't give up. I won't let up. And I won't be turned around. Because here's where I stand. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, that after you have done all you can to stand, stand therefore. So my question to each and every one of you tonight at the sound of my voice is where will you be standing? Hallelujah. Father God, in the mighty and master's name of Jesus, I just want to say first and foremost, Father God, for allowing me uh, one more time to come before your people, Father God, your sheep, to give me, uh, to be able to give them what you've already given me to be able to preach unto them what you've already preached to me and to teach them what you've already taught me. And I thank you, Father God, for in mighty name of Jesus, for continuing to forgive me of all of my sins, past, present, and future, my sins of omission as well as my sins of commission. Because, Father God, I know I have fallen short of your glory, and I know I've missed your mark on several occasions. I also want to say thank you, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, for continuing to forgive me of all the offenses that I have committed against others, God, intentionally and unintentionally. So as I pray these prayers before you and these cloud of witnesses, that they will not fall upon their fears. And it is in Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name that I pray and give thanks. Now let your church hear what the Spirit is saying. My, 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 get ready, get ready, get ready. It's SWAT time, y'all. Spiritual warfare, advanced teaching. And you already know who this is, God's warrior, Bishop Shaolin M.B. Abrams Sr. And I just want to thank each and every one of you who thought it not robbery to join us again tonight for another time of teaching. Yes, it's teaching time. So, if you do not want to hear the unadulterated word of God, this is not the place for you to be. Because not only do I preach, but I teach the whole counsel of God, from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. Because as I said time and time again, my words mean absolutely nothing compared to the word of God. And if at any time you miss anything that I have said, or that I say, or any of the scriptures that I give, this broadcast is being recorded. So you can listen to it in, its, in entirety on our website, and I will give you that information after the lesson. So let's get right into it as we are in another uh, lesson, lesson number six, as we talk about legal and ramifications of our calling. And as always, I start in scripture, the scripture that we ended with the previous day, I will begin in, and we ended in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 8 through 11, as we were talking about uh, uh, father of the faithful, which we know is Abraham. So Hebrews 11 8 to 11 reminds us that by faith, Abraham obeyed uh, when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, as we go into lesson number six, uh, this lesson actually focuses on three aspects of the Christian life. Number one, that God uses Abraham's example 
as the overall pattern to teach us how we, we should respond in faith to God's calling. Number two, that each called person actually receives two callings, but everybody rejects the first one. Now, the first calling comes largely from the created world and the easy availability of God's word, both of which give ample evidence of the creator God's existence. Most people reject the initial calling by simply ignoring it. I know that I did. Uh, going on with life as if God's existence and requirements are of little importance. And the second calling, though, is so personal that Jesus declares in John 10 and 3 that God calls us by name. But this summoning has far more impact and few called in this manner rejected outright. And last but not least, that Abraham is considered to be father of the faithful. In John 8, Jesus explains this in terms of family resemblance, not physical resemblance, because Abraham's seed is drawn from all nations and races, but spiritual resemblance, that is, similarity in faithful conduct according to God's way of life. So let's get right into lesson number six as we talk about legal and ramifications of our calling. So in this lesson, we will string a number of scriptures together to show step by step what happened to Abraham when he obeyed God's call. This step by step outline parallels what happens to each of God's children legally and spiritually when God's calling is obeyed. It will also help us grasp the roots of some frequently occurring biblical terminology. Now, Genesis uh, 12, uh, uh, 1 and verse 4 sets the foundation. The Bible says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your family, your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now the Christian, Abraham might be termed the first Christian, is called and led from his old position in relation to God and to the world. Now to this we can add 1 John 5 and 19. The Bible says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And Galatians 1 and 4 contributes another factor. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Then John 15 and 19 confirms the transaction being described. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So the first step resulting from God's calling then begins to remove the called one from being under the sway of Satan in this present evil world to being under God. And the second step is that at the same time, our spiritual condition in relation to God and the world also changes. So regarding this, Paul writes in Romans 6 and 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Then the apostle John adds in 1 John 3 and 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Then Romans 8, 8 through 10 describes a more complete change. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So the second result is that God's calling brings the Christian into a new spiritual union with new kindred, a new family, 
and new relationship. Thus, God's very personal calling creates two separations and two attachments. It separates us from the world in death and joins us to the kingdom of God in life. Let me say that again because I'm trying to help a whole bunch of people. So God's very personal calling creates two separations and two attachments. It separates us from the world in death and joins us to the kingdom of God in life. So understanding these two separations is, is important toward growth in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, according to 2 Peter 3 and 18. Because the world concentrates heavily on justification while treating sanctification very superficially. So practically, this world's Christianity places great emphasis on accepting Christ in his blood for the forgiveness of sin, but little on the obedience to his governance of our lives. Thus, real sanctification really occurs among worldly Christians, or as I like to call them, church folk. So 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2 addresses sanctification this way. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersed the dispersation of Pontus, Galatia, Canapesia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So it is the life that is obedient to God and separated from the world that pro provides the proof of one's conversion. So if the Christian is legally cleared of guilt before God and obedient to him, he no longer belongs to the world. The Bible no longer perceives a person as being in the flesh. Philippians 3 and 20 offers understanding of another separation from the world. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. So his spiritual separation produces for the Christian a legal transfer of citizenship that he must recognize. But Colossians 1, 12 and 13 also confirms this. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into of the son of his love. My God, my God. I'm trying to help a whole bunch of people tonight. So as a result of these separations, the Christian must live his life as a stranger and a pilgrim as if in a foreign land, obeying the laws of his new nation by placing higher priority in his activities as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And this opens the door to another line of practical thought, conduct, and attitude. James 4 and 4 says it like this. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Uh-oh. Wherefore, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. My, 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 my. I'm trying to help a whole bunch of church folks tonight. So we normally do whatever we can to avoid our enemies, even to the point of fleeing from them if necessary. See, this reality should help us to understand why God commands us in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So it is by means of conduct motivated by the Holy Spirit that we are to come out from among unbelievers and be separate. Listen, that means other church folks too. So we can't, we must not straddle the fence because we cannot serve two masters. Once we are called, we must serve God or we will receive God's grace in vain. 
according to 2 Corinthians.